hello again. And this time, this is a video. Last week was an audio, and the week before that was a video. And these videos I'm posting on YouTube. So if you're following this Old Testament study on YouTube, you are only having two out of six episodes. So if you want to get the missing ones that are audio, you have to go to www.f, like in father, j, like in Jonathan, m, like in Morse, and then ministry. So you have two m's next to each other, dot org. And then you'll see uh, on the catechetical page, Old Testament 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And two of them will be uh, videos. I'll probably continue on with videos, but then again, since this is supposed to be done with a group in front of me, uh, but they can't do that because of the quarantine. So we may go back to uh, audios uh, later on. Now, last time we were talking about the book of uh, Genesis, but we just looked at the story of Joseph, and we came to see what the message of that book was all about, or that, that story was all about in the book. And I said, you know, you cannot understand a verse of the Bible unless you understand the context in which that verse belongs. And you can't understand a story unless you understand the book. And you can't understand the book unless you understand the whole of the Hebrew scriptures uh, because they all play together and relate together and they all carry forth the same message so if you're finding something completely different then you have missed the point so we were looking at the story of Joseph which is in the book of Genesis so now let's take a look at the book of Genesis the book of Genesis is in three parts Chapters 1 through 11 deal with primeval history. And the next section, chapters 12 through 36, is the patriarchal narrative. And then 37 to 50, the third part, is the story of Joseph. Now, in Genesis 1 through 11, the primeval history, the focus is on the world. You know, it starts with creation stories in the beginning. And it's interesting because in the beginning you have Genesis. And in a sense, when we see Exodus, Exodus is a new beginning. But we'll get to that later on. So the first focus is on the world. And the story ends with a catastrophe. Something is going wrong. And basically people are not responding to God's love and mercy. So Genesis 12 then opens a whole new episode, and the focus now becomes focused on one man, Abram, who becomes Abraham, and he is the father of a nation. Now, God gives him a command, and that command is followed by a promise. So it goes, love, <laughs> oh, excuse me, leave your country, your relatives, and your father's house, and go to the land that I will show you. I will cause you to become, to become the father of a great nation. I will bless you and make you famous and will make you a blessing to others. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. All the families of the earth shall be blessed through you. Quite a promise there. But the command and the promise reverberate through the whole book of Genesis from beginning to end. We can already see the relevance of Genesis chapter 39, the story of Joseph and the Joseph story, because the imprisonment of Joseph is a very key part in the elevation of 
but he was elevated to a position of power. He is the one who is going to rescue the family, the family of the promise, the one through whom all these blessings are going to come later on. So, if you didn't have the story of Joseph, you couldn't have the story of Abraham. Because the rescue of Joseph's family, the story of God's promise, can continue in the context of the whole of the Testament. This is what it's all about. You know, it, the Testament is a covenant. It is a covenant between God and humanity. And so we have the beginning, but we also are now seeing the working out of the covenant. And we are seeing the role that Joseph plays so that Abraham is the one who has the promise. And then we will see how the promises all work out through the various, of various covenants that God forms. And we'll see those in detail. So a nation is born out of the family of Abraham, making the stay in Egypt. God then shows his power and grace by bringing them into the promised land. So you have Abraham, his family, and then you have Joseph going off into Egypt. And he is moving the family into Egypt, which is part of God's plan to show God's power. If Joseph wasn't in Egypt, the Jews wouldn't have been in Egypt and there wouldn't have been an exodus. And all of those people were the family. That became, through the experience of the exodus, the nation in the promised land. So everything is related to everything else. The Old Testament, the Hebrew Scriptures, is an account of the threats, constant threats, never-ending threats, to and the fulfillment of the promises of Genesis 12, 1 through 3. Because in those three verses, in chapter 12, you have God setting forth. He tells Abram to leave, go to a new place. You know, it was, you know, I'm going to make things easy for you. No. And so, even Abram at the very beginning could have said to God, no, I won't go. It reminds me of a, a cry from an earlier time in the history of the United States. I won't go. But no, he goes. He trusts in God. He leaves everything behind, and he goes. But why does God do that? God does it because of Adam and Eve. It was working together. And so then Adam and Eve sinned that great, great catastrophe uh, and God told them he'd send a redeemer and then you have Abram coming because Abram is going to create the family and the nation of the redeemer Joseph brings that family into the land of Egypt where they will have the exodus experience all related then you have to get into uh, exodus to understand the story of the Exodus. Now, so you have to understand all of this in terms of its context. And it is always essential to read the Bible in context. Because the context, though, can be kind of flexible. And so as we move from the books of the Bible, we examine in some detail the context of Genesis the Joseph story, as an example of historical prose, a narrative set in the context of a ever larger story, moving very easily from one point to the next, from the immediate context to the broad context. And we saw how the single event fit into the larger context. But with passages like Proverbs 10, verse 1, which goes like this, 
and it's a lovely line, the Proverbs of Solomon. A wise son gives his father joy, but a foolish son is a grief to his mother. Simple verse. We can't understand that context the same way we understand that Proverbs is, doesn't tell us a story. It presents wisdom principles. A close examination of the structure of the book shows that 10, chapter 10, verse 1, stands at a moment of transition. It is a transition from an extended wisdom discourse that can be as long as a whole chapter, as it's going on, to the presentation, the next step is transition to a presentation of a series of pithy statements, pithy proverbs, that usually occupy a single verse, but may occasionally extend to a handful of verses. As we read in Proverbs 10.3, which I will now read to you, the Lord does not let the just go hungry, but the craving of the wicked he thwarts. Now, and then, uh, verse, and then in, uh, in, ooh, in Proverbs ten thirty one, see what happens when I don't keep my notes together. Um, And I prefer using the same uh, scripture text that Catholics uh, use in Mass so that there's not that discontinued, discontinu oh, discontinu no, discontinu uh, forget it, uh, between what they hear in church and what they uh, read in the Bible. So I use the uh, USB, USCCB.org. That's United States Conference of Catholic Bishops. And you could pick the book in the Bible, and it's the same one that you'd hear in church. So I bring it up online. So chapter 10, verse 31. The mouth of the just yields wisdom, but the perverse tongue will be cut off. So that chapter, you can see, we're obviously transitioning from uh, one thing to another. And although Proverbs uh, may have the same general topic and they may occasionally appear together, more often the Proverbs proceed from one topic to another without any apparent connection between them. They just like drop down. And the verses immediately following 10.1, for example, speaks of wise and foolish children, which we saw. We encountered Proverbs on ill-gotten gain. That's the second. On hunger, that's the third. And on laziness, the fourth and fifth. Accordingly, whenever you know I talk about this, you, you can't look at Proverbs always together. Sometimes you have to go find the different Proverbs that are related to each other on the same topic and you know compress them together to understand what they're talking about. And uh, individually, they're usually less illuminating than other Proverbs because you just saw you have these particular ones which sound nice. But what's he getting at? What's he talking about? On the other hand, we must not understand individual Proverbs in isolation, even though they give the impression of being model-like. So often you'll sign, you know, pillowcases or, you know, with uh, the Proverbs on them. And, yeah, that sounds nice, and uh, but it may make an excellent point. But the point is in context of a bigger picture. Everything is in case of a bigger picture. In a nutshell, the discourse of Proverbs 1 through 9 creates a context in which to understand the pithy Proverbs of 10 to 31, that transition in 10. Uh, the discourses present a series of metaphors which climax in chapters 8 and 9. The basic metaphor is the image of life as 
a path. The reader, which is the man in the book, uh, is offered various helps along the way. He's also got a whole bunch of hindrances along the way. And his father teacher warns him. That's what this book is about. For instance, of the possibility of an ambush. Uh, chapter 1, verses 11 and 18. He is told that he will encounter temptations that will lure him off the path. The prime temptation is the strange woman, the adulteress, who will try to seduce him to his great harm, Proverbs 5 and 7. But there is another woman, wisdom herself, who urges the reader to follow her on the path. The two women are most fully described in the climactic chapters of wisdom, chapter 8, verses 1 through 9, is a woman characterized by righteousness, truth, justice, prudence, and many other positive uh, virtues. On the other hand, folly, found in 9, 13 through 18, is a woman who is brash, ignorant, and deceptive. Each woman calls out to the reader, the man on the path, to come join her for dinner and a serious relationship. Chapter 9, 4 through 6, and chapter 9, 16 through 17. Who are these women? They both are on a hill. Chapter 9, verses 3. This is a clue we need to solve the riddle of their identity. See the context. It's a much bigger picture. You have to know more than just the verses themselves. In the ancient East, the only building on the high point of a city was its temple. Thus, Lady Wisdom is symbolically the image of the true God himself. Folly, on the other hand, represents all those other gods that you constantly hear about, Baal and everybody else, the Egyptian gods and all, all those others, gods and goddesses that somehow ended up in their own temples, but they also ended up in the temple in Jerusalem. So, that Proverbs 10, and they, they were trying to take Israel, Israelites into a false religion away from the true religion. So see, the Proverbs are also talking about this spiritual context of what we saw in, in Genesis, you know, the following the path of God, and this isn't just practical advice. The Proverbs 10.1 is a deeply religious verse, can only be seen in that context. Wise children bring joy to their parents. It says father, okay, but that means they have joined themselves with lady wisdom. They follow the true God. They worship Yahweh. But foolish children bring grief to their parents by worshiping idols. The implications are unmistakable. Those who embrace wisdom find knowledge. They gain life. They gain God. And those who follow folly will end up in the grave. From that brief look of Proverbs, and particularly verses 10-1, we readily see that we must be sensitive to the different types of of literary context in the whole of the scripture. For this verse necessitates an approach totally unlike our examination of Genesis 39. In other words, we must attend to the genre of the book that we are studying. So this is another thing that we have to do. The third principle is to identify the genre 
of the books and the passage. On one hand, the Bible, as its name implied, is a single book. And it gets its name from the city of Byblos, which was known for putting book, printing books. Uh, uh, when, I mean, in times before they were printed, they were you know, written by hand. And so Byblos was where it was, and the most common thing was these books of Scripture. And so the, it took its name. You know, that's what we get from Byblos, the Bible. Of course, I do like the cute expression, basic instruction before leaving earth. Now, it's a single book, but, and I'm, when I'm saying this, it's a single book in the Hebrew scriptures for the Jews, and it's a single book of Hebrew and Christian scripture for the Christians. So, what we're talking basically here about the Hebrew scriptures, it's an anthology a veritable library of all kinds of books, not like you have in the New Testament. That's a much more, less variety. You have so much more in the Hebrew scriptures. And so when you go in, it's like going into a library and you can pick out different types of books. And uh, libraries and bookstores usually arrange books according to literary type. One shelf, biographies. Another, novels. Yet a third, travel books. Each different kind of book, each literary type, constitutes a separate genre. Genre, uh, and by the way, I'm just thinking, you, know, you go into a bookstore, uh, you, know, you have so many other things there, but I like this image of the bookstore the library to go in because sometimes you feel like history sometimes you feel like romance sometimes you feel like adventure they're all there in the bible and i think you know sometimes we get lost with the desire to read from beginning to end and so sometimes it's better to take a look at particular genres and read those things together so that we have uh, you know, a, a different kind of experience. Even though they may not flow one into the other, the, the feeling. Because remember we talked that the Bible is not just a book of the mind, it is a book of the heart. Now getting back, genre, it's a term derived from French and it's related to our English words, general and generalization. A genre of literature is a group of texts associated with one another by virtue of similarities. In other words, similar styles. In other words, a genre is an abstraction, a generalization, if you will, regarding a specific concrete text. The similarities that bind these texts together may be of many different types. The texts may be alike in their content, content, their structure, their mood, their phraseology, or some contribution thereof. The Bible includes a variety of ancient genres. On one level, we can divide the Bible into two genres, prose narrative and poetry. You can immediately see the Proverbs doesn't actually fit in. But see, those are the two basic uh, genres that you will find. But on an even more constructive level, we can speak of history, law, lyric poetry, wisdom literature, prophecy, and apocalyptic. I think those are much better because, I mean, it gives you much more, uh, much more work, but it gives you a wider picture of all those books on the shelves that each of these categories can be further divided into subgenres, highlights, 
uh, an important uh, characteristic of a genre. It's a flexible concept. Genres do not fall out of heaven. They are habits of writing and reading that can be stretched out over time. And when we gather together next week, we will talk about the, we'll start with the genre of individual books. And if you have questions, uh, you can email me at Jonathan, J-O-N-A-T-H-A-N dot Morse, M-O-R-S-E, at V-A dot gov. Uh, if you want to see more, as I pointed out before, you can go to fjmministries.org. And I should note that uh, all of my talks are based upon readings that I have done and books that I, I have here. And uh, you will see that sometimes my style will vary according to where I'm getting the information from because I can use it. I'm not a creator. I am rather somebody who brings the contributions of others to still a greater audience. And so I'm being basically, I'm a plagiarist. Uh, and, uh, but they, I don't plagiarize from just one. Some particular sections of this will be from particular uh, works and I will mention them uh, later. But uh, the reason I don't in the beginning, very simply, because like footnotes are at the end and I prefer endnotes, is the fact that I don't want you looking at those books because then you'll see that I don't always agree with what they say, so I don't say it. And sometimes I add a lot of other stuff in there. But uh, I hope that you will get something out of this. And um, feel free to email me either at the VA address, jonathan.morris at va.gov, or if you go to fjmministries.org, there's a place there that also sends me emails. And most of all, I am very thankful that you are watching this, and I found that actually people do. And so I consider you to be a blessing to me, and I hope I am a blessing to you. God bless you, and thank you very much.